Well, I think that, that for all the negatives involved in making a sequel, uh, you have positives. And one of the positives is if you can take that, that initial programming that the audience has from the other film and then do a little twists and turns on it and, and like you said, play against their expectation of what's going to happen. They, if it's done in, in, a, in a not hostile way to the audience, then they realize that there's a little bit of fun involved and uh, that the film is having a little bit of fun with them, but, but it, it makes them participants. It, it shows that, the, that the, the filmmakers assume a certain knowledge on their part. What I try to do in, w within Aliens, with, with the various scenes that you mentioned, is make, them the, make the scenes so that they functioned if you had never seen the first film. They didn't seem like something coming out of nowhere if you, didn't, if you hadn't seen the first movie, but so that they had a second level resonance for the people that had had seen the first film. Mm -hmm. it, I think it makes the it goes back to that idea of of the of the film being more of a participation experience as opposed to a passive experience. And that's that's uh, one of the great advantages of of doing a sequel if you can if you can pull it off. Presumably one of the major problems is coming up with an explanation of why Ridley would go back Ripley <laughs> <laughs> or Ridley <laughs> would go back in the first place. Uh, and this you got around by Establishing the whole military motif, and, right? And they're going back because they're going to kick ass, basically. Yeah, if you think about it, you know, from a from a story standpoint, how is the audience going to relate to this person if they put themselves needlessly into jeopardy again? When any sensible thinking person would not go back to <laughs> anywhere near the right. damn alien if they had if they had a choice. Um, so I, I tried to approach that, that from a number of different questions. I mean, one way of doing it would have had you know, her ship drift back to the planet and she's back to the I mean, that's not what the story was about. But, I mean, I think there's a couple of things going on. Sure, they offer her a job, but that's not a good enough reason. They offer to protect her. You know, that's, that helps. They're going to give her a bunch of Marines. And so she feels relatively secure in going back. But the real reason is the cathartic psychological reason. There has to be a, uh, uh, an inner motivation that's, that uh, even if people don't understand it, they, I, I, I mean, if, even if people disagree with it and say, well, I, that wouldn't be enough for me, they at least can see, can see a motivation for her to do that. In a way, it goes back to, to this kind of combat experience that, that people who've been in high-stress situations uh, undergo. And it's, it's a fairly well understood bit of human psychology, which is uh, when you come that close to death, whatever it is, if it's a car accident or whether you're in, in combat, um, you tend to fixate on that moment in your life and just relive mm -hmm. it over and over. And, and, and it, what showed up in, in, in Vietnam was that people who were there for a year would go back, even though it was the worst thing that ever happened to them. Ron Cobb, who of course is one of your principal designers on the film, said that in the early stages you were very consciously making a Vietnam War movie in outer space. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. As an element, mm -hmm. but to me the the whole uh, the whole Vietnam um, experience was almost science fictional, in the sense that it was it was the first real high tech war um, that was waged against an extremely low tech enemy and lost, which to me is is a is a very is a very strange thing. It showed how technology didn't work, and there's an aspect of that in this film. It's like why are we losing? One of the problems that must have hit you at the beginning of this project was on Alien, they spent all this time and effort and trouble and money developing one, one. one alien. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing a movie with a whole planet full of them. <laughs> right, hundreds. Uh, I presume there must have been some concern on your part that you were going to be able to or get somebody who could pull that off. Yeah, the, the, there was a lot of concern uh, in that regard. In fact, the studio was very, very uh, leery that we could, uh, we could pull it off. And I, I promised them on a, you know, on a stack of Bibles, so to speak, that I would do it all with six suits. And we did. I mean, there are, there, are only, there are only six in one shot at one time. It's only editorially that you believe you're seeing uh, more than that, uh, because they just keep coming at you from different <laughs> angles. It's the same six guys, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll be Western where they had six cows. Huh? You got it. You know, I mean, Roger Corman once said that he he filmed the the, uh, the fall of the Roman Empire with uh, with five extras in a bush. You know, <laughs> I believe he did it too. I never saw the movie, but but um, anyway, that was that was the principle. But the point is that it does it does take all your 
uh, uh, every every ounce of of skill of of your skill, meaning my skill as the director and and the people working for me, the cameraman and the special effects people and so on, to to make those very quick cuts count as much as possible, make them as believable as possible. And also, what I tried to do was was uh, uh, make the aliens interesting from a from a dynamic standpoint and the way they moved. We were, we did a lot of experimentation with different ways of of uh, of moving them, you know, hanging them on wires and shooting them at different speeds and t turning sets upside down and sideways and and you know turning the camera upside down and just every trick in the book to give them this weird sort of dynamic uh, un uh, unhuman type of motion. And you know, I mean, I think that you're you're basically just being bombarded with so much imagery that it's that it's you have to just kind of give up and say, all right, fine, they're aliens. You know, yeah. <laughs> they're not guys in suits. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, once again, we, uh, you know, we, I went more for motion as opposed to design. Uh, we kept the design more or less the same as what H.R. Giger designed for the one alien that they had in Alien, the full-sized adult, adult version of which we, you know, had, had many. We spent most of our R&D time on motion because I, I thought that, that quick blurring lizard-like or insect-like leap was more important than, than the physical sculptural design of the suit. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of makeup and prosthetics people make when they're, when they're dealing with this sort of thing, is that they, they, they lavish all their attention on the sculptural detail, the surface texture, et cetera, of the suit. And they fail to realize that people need very few pixels of information to identify a human figure. And most of that identification is through motion, you know, the way we walk. The way we walk is so ingrained in us mentally that you can see it just like that. So it was, what we did was we actually um, redesigned the suit and made it simpler and less sophisticated and basically uh, freed it so that, uh, so that it, it was much more flexible. And then um, we found people to, to be inside the suits who were gymnasts and acrobats and that sort of thing. And then we hung them on wires and had them act like lizards. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, it was, um, it was a, you know, a, study in, a study in motion mm -hmm. and, and in human motion. But also there's another form beyond those, those sort of smaller aliens, which we called the warriors in the sense of like warrior ants. There's an, another form, which is the, you know, the alien queen, right. which is a completely unhuman silhouette and unhuman geometry. It was definitively not a suit. And I think that, and, and that's what we show more clearly. The, the queen uh, dramatically is, is, a, is a trump card for you. That's it's the, it's the way for you to give another ending to your movie in a way. Uh, and I presume was also a, a primary motivator was that you wanted to present something that hadn't been done before in, in, mm -hmm. the, in the first movie. You had the, right. the face huggers and the chest bursters and the warriors were all right. kind of leftover elements from the first one. Uh, yeah. The Queen was an opportunity to take a design stance that was beyond the first film, you know, completely new territory, create a new organism, basically. Um, and when we see the queen on her sort of her sort of biomechanoid throne with the egg sac and all that, we understand in, intuitively what she is. I think you know we see where the eggs see where the eggs come from. We see her relationship with it and and, and all that. And then we you know get to get to take her out of that environment and have her do other things as well. I had an image of what I wanted this thing to look like. Which was obviously, you know, inspired by Giger's approach, H.R. Giger, the the Swiss um, artist and designer. And you know, I I wanted to continue in, with with that design philosophy, but I wanted to give it certain other characteristics in terms of size and speed and grace and uh, certain feminine characteristics that the alien warrior didn't have. Um, so I just sat down and drew it, drew a few different versions of it. And actually, the first sort of full sketch that I did of it is pretty remarkably close to what we finally wound up with. Uh, I don't know whether this is a coincidence or not, but it seems to be that uh, in, in Aliens, you kind of begin the film with dream and you end it with a reference to a dream. You have Ripley who is terrified and can't get the dream out of her mind, mm -hmm. and, and this is really what is the impetus that gets her to go back to the planet. Right. And the tagline of the film is Newt 
says as she's being tucked into her hibernation chamber, can I dream now? Mm -hmm. Dreaming is the, the essence of humanity, and I was wondering, is there anything in that for you? Uh, I don't know if it's that comment so much as just a personal thing that, you know, I get a lot of imagery from my own, from my own dreams, and the, the um, you know, I find them to be, you know, a cathartic experience and a good inspiration for, for imagery and for, for concepts and situations and so on. Um, and I think that that's, that's a, you know, dreams are, are a shared experience. It's a, it's a way for us to all uh, leave this plane and, and, uh, and explore around a little bit. And that's what, that's what, you know, movies do as well, especially in the science fiction context. And a film like, uh, like Aliens is basically just one long bad dream, <laughs> if, you, if you think about it. And you get to wake up at the end and, and leave, leave the theater. And I think that that's, you know, it, it ties into a lot of primal and, and subconscious fears that are very universal for people. You know, fears of tight places, fears of the dark, of water, of fire, of high, pl you know, I mean, you name it, it's all, you know, a lot of those, you know, sort of uh, Freudian tensions are there in the designs of the creature and the, Im the implied threat and all that, all that. It was also a way in, in this specific film, in Aliens, of unifying uh, the, the Ripley character and the Newt character. They both have the same nightmare and that bonds them. It makes them the same person in a way. And, and c watching Aliens is a, a lot like their experiences, uh, their experience in the film, which is you're going through this long, dark tunnel and you come out at the end and you're, and you're going to be okay. They can, they can dream again. Their dream landscape is not going to have these creatures in it from that, that point onward. You know? It's like the idea that Ripley survived the first time, but she didn't survive mentally, you mm -hmm. know, psychologically. She's still a, she's a basket case. You know? <laughs> at the end of this film, I think you feel like not only has she survived physically, but she's, she's out of the woods, she's going to be okay. So it's actually a, a better ending in that sense. Are we going to sleep all the way home? All the way home. Can I dream? Yes, honey. I think we both can. Affirmative.